Scriptures on Divine Healing, Part 2. I am working through a little booklet that I put together some years ago on divine healing in the Scriptures. And this appears on our website, and you can download it for free. It's a PDF. It's called Scriptures for Healing. Uh, go to our website, which is reachoutfellowship.org or reachoutfellowship.com. Click on Teachings and then on the Topical Studies. And then go to Divine Healing and you'll see this booklet, uh, Scriptures for Healing. You can print out the scriptures and as you watch this video or select the audio video alternative, uh, you're listening to the word, you're reading it along with me, um, you're speaking it, and that's going to get all of your senses involved. Because the word is what's going to build faith, and faith is what is going to bring healing. So in part one, we covered from Genesis chapter 1 right through Luke. In Luke's gospel, chapter 13, we're going to pick up part two now, and I'm just going straight through the Bible, basically just reading the word with a little bit of commentary to explain, but primarily just to get the word in your heart and in mine and cause us to really build faith for the Lord. So let's ask the Lord to help us, shall we? Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. May it cause faith to arise in our hearts and may we worship you and be healthy and be healed. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 17. Now it happened as he, that's Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers. They stood afar off, and they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were they not found uh, who re returned glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. That's a recurring theme, your faith has made you well. It's not a question of God's will. God already placed our sicknesses on Jesus at the cross, at the whipping post. We know that by his stripes we're healed. He bore our sicknesses, carried our infirmities, and by his stripes we're healed. And we find here that this foreigner... The Samaritan is the one who gave thanks and praise. John 4. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Belief, faith, that's what unlocks the key to health and healing. John 5. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem was the sheep gate, uh, and there was a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. 
Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Notice that stirring of the water. That's a point of contact. That's a faith-producing action. If I can get into that water first, I will be healed, is the idea. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before him. Imagine how frustrated he was. 38 years. How many times had he tried to get to the pool and somebody cut in ahead of him? Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Now the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered and said, He who made me well said to take up your bed and walk. Then they said, Who is this man who said, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. And afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So it was faith that had healed him. He was not to sin, lest something worse fall upon him. John 9, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Now as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Notice the number of times the Lord not only says your faith has made you well, but he makes them have an action. He told those lepers we just discussed to go and show themselves to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. Here this man has to go to the pool and wash to show faith. Faith has to have action. Lord, not only give me faith to believe, but the action that's going to demonstrate that faith. John 10, 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And I think abundant life includes health and healing, don't you? I like healing when you're sick, but I like health better not getting sick in the first place. John 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Open invitation. Come to the Lord for healing of whatever sort. And he says we're going to do greater works. We're not greater than Jesus, of course, but in number we are great and he is at the right hand of the Father enabling us to do that, so we're working together with him. John 15. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Now we're assuming we're praying in the will of God and God's making it very clear here that his will is always to heal. And so we're going to pray with great faith, but we have to abide in him, be connected to him. John 16, in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. Ask. Acts 3, 
Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had daily laid at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. So the man had to have faith. He also had to have action because he was told to look at them. He was also told to stand up. And as he did, he received his healing. Acts chapter 5. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities, to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Such faith. And again, the point of contact. If the shadow of Peter falls upon me, I shall be healed. We need points of contact at times. Prayer cloths. We use those from time to time, uh, sparingly, but uh, we use prayer cloths. And um, we'll anoint with oil, and we'll say to somebody, let's pray on this cloth. Take this to a loved one, have them put it on the part of the body that needs healing. It's not the cloth, but it's the faith that's released. I'm putting this cloth on my head and I shall be healed. The anointing oil from the elders, the bread and the cup in communion. When I partake of these, I'm going to be healed. Acts chapter 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Acts 9. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately, so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Acts chapter 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Healing is doing good, and it gets rid of the oppression of the devil. Acts chapter 14. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, and Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Acts 14. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Stone to death, raised from the dead by healing. Acts chapter 16. 
Now it happened as he went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. She had a demon spirit that was telling her information as a fortune teller might receive it. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul greatly annoyed and turned to the, and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Well, there's a pattern of how to deal with a demon spirit. Notice what he says. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And so it's in the name of Jesus because that's where the power is. Jesus already defeated Satan and all of his demonic spirits at the cross. So we need Jesus' name. And keep it simple. If you have faith, you don't need to go on and on and on with the devil. When I watch a mother discipline a child who's misbehaving in the store, she doesn't go on and on and on. She says, knock it off. Stop it. Sometimes only a look from her eyes sends the message, no more. Acts chapter 19. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. And that's the scripture that gives rise to the practice of the prayer cloth I was talking about a short while ago. Acts 28. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. Romans chapter 4. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. He was about a hundred years old, that's Abraham, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, talking about the fact that they were too old to have children. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. And that's the essence of faith, fully convinced, giving glory to God, strengthened in faith, knowing that what God has promised he is able to perform. Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that's talking about the resurrection for all of us who are in Christ. God's able to raise us from the dead. Could also raise somebody uh, physically to live and then die again. There are people who are raised from the dead, even as Jesus and his disciples did that. But it's talking certainly about the resurrection, life and power that all will have as these dead bodies rise again from the grave to give glory to God. Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And among those wonderful things he gives us freely is healing. Romans 10, 8, talking about salvation. Remember the word salvation means health, healing, prosperity, deliverance. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The word saved or sozo means physical healing. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sozo, physical healing, but also emotional, spiritual so confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as your healer. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. You'll be healed. You'll be delivered. Romans 10, 17. 
So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what we're doing here, getting the word of God deep within us, first our minds and then our, our hearts and our spirits. Our spiritual man who is born again loves this word. 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So these bodies do not belong to us, they belong to God, and we are to glorify God in these bodies, not only in terms of purity and holiness, but also in health and healing. Say, Lord, I want to glorify you through a body that is healthy and well, as a testimony to your saving power. 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you, such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will the temp with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So that talks about healing in our moral structure. Lord, keep me away from sin and addiction and temptation. Make the way of escape for me, Lord. You're my deliverer. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us. God, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So God has delivered me in the past. I pray he does now and will in the future. And we need your prayers to make sure that we are strong and delivered. So God in healing is able to deliver us from difficult situations, difficult trials and tribulations. 2 Corinthians 4. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Talking about these limited physical bodies. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So these bodies are limited. We have all sorts of trials and tribulations, but that shows the power of the Lord Jesus, that when I am weak, by his grace I am strong. And we're dying to the Lord Jesus. Lord, help me to die to self, die to the passions of the flesh, die to my will and my way, and may Christ live in and through me to the glory of God. I descend the throne of my heart. Jesus Christ, ascend the throne for your glory. 2 Corinthians 5. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We cannot be healed, cannot minister to God and to others unless we do it by faith. 2 Corinthians 10 talks about how to handle the great battleground, which is the mind. That's where the devil gets these fiery darts coming in to doubt the Lord, to be critical, to be negative. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So the great battleground is the mind and we have powerful weapons, the weapons of faith, the name of Jesus, prayer, uh, other believers, the word, the sword of the spirit. And so we are to, through those weapons, in the name of Jesus, pull down the strongholds, the arguments, all that the devil tries to throw in there. And then I use this last sentence to really apply to the same thing. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Punish those negative thoughts. Cast them out. 
and say, no, I will not talk about doubt and fear and unbelief. I will glorify God. Galatians 3. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Jesus was cursed at the cross so we would not have to be cursed through the punishment for our sins or the consequences of our sins, including disease and, and poverty and strife and anxiety, all of that. Jesus bore that curse because of sin and we are free and healed in his name. Ephesians 5, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Talking about the body of Christ. We are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. Talking about that spiritually. But I see it also physically that, Lord, I'm part of your body, and your body by your grace as well. Your body as well, Lord. Your flesh, your bones. May I have that healing in my life as well. Philippians 2. And being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Jesus humbled himself and then became exalted. And we need to humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, let the resurrection power and exalted life of Jesus be manifested in my body, spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, and even relationally. We get anxiety and fear. Here's a remedy for you. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything virtuous or there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So watch your thinking. If you have a problem, give it to God. I like the analogy, take your problem, put it in the box, put the box on the altar, walk away praising God. And watch your mind. Think about those things that are good and pure and holy, not negative, not things that will bring you down. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. So when the Lord cleanses us through his righteousness, we are cleansed in our spirits, our souls, and our bodies. But I like to apply that also to physical wellness and emotional wellness and spiritual wellness. Lord, may I be strong spiritually and emotionally and physically. Second Thessalonians, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. And so we see faith growing exceedingly. And that faith is going to cause love to abound and to flow. And that's going to have a healing effect when we are loving instead of hating, when we're ministering instead of being selfish, giving instead of just receiving. It's going to be healthy for us. We'll be blessed because of it. Second Timothy talks about handling fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound or disciplined mind. So the next time we have fear that's not from God, 
There is a godly fear, watch out for heights and watch out for going too close to the edge or touching fire. But we're talking about uh, demonic kinds of fear. It's really a spirit. I have not been given a spirit of fear, we say. I've been given power, love, and a disciplined mind. Hebrews chapter 2. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, meaning their physical beings, he himself likewise shared in the same, talking about Jesus, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. As Jesus died, he destroyed the devil and his power over death. And it says, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus has healed us of the fear of dying and of the separation that we would have from God if it were not from Jesus. Death means separation. Jesus died and defeated Satan and defeated that fear within us. So death becomes really a completion of that oneness with God as we are with him. Hebrews 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So confess your faith in God to heal, and you know he is faithful and he will do it. Hebrews 10.35 Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. In other words, hang in there. Hebrews 11, talking about faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith knows that it has it even before it sees it or feels it. And so that's what faith is, holding on to God's promises, now we have to make sure he has promised something, otherwise it's pure presumption. But in the area of healing, he wants us well. Jesus demonstrated that, the word demonstrates that. So we believe it and we stand on it. Hebrews 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we look to Jesus. We cast away the weights, those things that slow us down. They're not sins, but they're impediments. We cast away the sins so that we can get the full healing power of God flowing through our lives. Hebrews chapter 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He healed in his day here on earth. He heals today. James 4 talks about how to handle the devil. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So resist him. He has to flee as you resist him in the name of Jesus Christ. James 5, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up, raise him up out of that sick bed. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there's healing by the elders. There's healing by one another. We're all commissioned to heal. 1 Peter 2.24, referring to Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. The stripes on his back at the whipping post brought about our healing. 1 John 3, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And being sick and disease-ridden in whatever way is not the work of God. That's the work of the devil. 
1 John 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So we believe in Jesus Christ, we exercise the faith he has given us, and that gives us victory even over disease. 1 John 5, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. In part one and in this part two, we've seen so many scriptures to show it is always the will of God to heal. So we can ask in confidence. Third John Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. John walked with Jesus and knew Jesus' will and his actions in healing. And he's praying for his friend to prosper and to be in health, even as his soul is prospering. He wants him physically well, as well as his soul and his spirit. Revelation 12 talks about healing in heaven. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. This is for the tribulation saints and it's for saints now and always. We overcome the work of the devil, including sickness, by the blood of the Lamb. That's the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. The word of their testimony, our testimony that I'm trusting God as my healer and my faith is in him. And they don't love their lives to the death. They don't live out of the fleshly side of their lives. They give that up and they serve the godly side, giving their lives completely for Jesus. And then finally, I look forward to seeing this, Revelation 22, verse 2. In the middle of its streets, this is the new heavenly city, in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there's going to be healing from the fruit of that tree. And uh, of course, there won't be any sickness or disease or sin uh, in the... Um, the heavenly city, but this is going to be for health and for keeping us healthy. And of course, as a symbol of the healing power of God. So I hope you have had a chance to go through these scriptures and you'll go through them again and again. Again, the little booklet scriptures on healing or for healing is on the internet, reachoutfellowship.org or .com and just go to uh, teachings, topical studies and divine healing. Print it out, put it at your bedside, Look at it first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our infirmities, and by his stripes were healed. Thank you, Jesus, for carrying our sins and all of sin's consequences. Help us to confess with our mouths that you are Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised you from the dead. Touch us, keep us well, keep us healthy, and if we get sick, Lord, touch and heal us in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen.